Yeah. Yeah, you can see my screen now, correct? I think you can. Yes, doctor. Yeah, we can. Yes, doctor. Yeah, so I was, I think I stopped last time here uh, where we, talk, we were talking about the poem and um, the next point I wanted you really to again uh, think about is when we say here in poetry we think about the word choice that is the diction that is how we really write poetry i mean the the important thing is we select our um, words and vocabulary and you know the expressions carefully because you know we want we want the effect um, of the language to be as powerful as as we can um, and really this is the idea here to also to look about the metaphors and the images and the associations and so on and this is what we mean here by the whole question of dic diction or you know um, the metaphorical um, poetical language really this is the idea what we say <clears throat> for example here i have um, a little example here about um, this little poem here notice there is no frigate like a book you know notice here the the really the um metaphors uh, later on of course um quickly you can see this there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away nor any coursers like a page of prancing poetry this traverse may the poorest take without oppress of toll how frugal is the chariot that bears a human soul i mean you can see um, um if you like uh, the this is of course written by emily dickinson she is the um really very amazing important really famous um you know american poet um and notice you, you know really notice what uh, she's here using uh, a lot of metaphors here really and the question here comparing the book to a frigate and a frigate really is a warship is a ship used for war you know really these are warships and ships that can travel that can fight that can go to so many places and so on she's saying well she's saying the book a book is like that you know and notice here of course the real funny uh, as i said the um, connotation at, that is the association that is the metaphors you know using here that this book when you read a book you travel so far away from reality that would mean take us lands away you know and again to say that no courses no courses like a page of prancing poetry so again she's saying not just any book but she said you know the book of poetry which will make you really jump and prance and dance you know uh, again she said prancing poetry and again you know, the twist takes you so far away changes you right may the poorest take without a press of toll you know even the poor very poor person can learn from this without doing anything without working hard in terms of you know uh, you know physical work the idea and again you know she she would uh, she goes on to say well I mean, this is really an amazing an amazing association here notice i think i explained this here for you notice emily dickinson is considering the power of words in poetry to carry us away to let us escape from our immediate surroundings into a world of imagination to do this she has compared literature to various means of transportation a boat steam forces wheeled land blah blah you know so uh, really this is uh, if you like here the the idea again when we said the the frigate suggests exploration adventure courses the beauty spirit and so on uh, really this is what i mean here uh, that um, we say in poetry of course we use the idea we use a lot of metaphors yes we use a lot of strange amazing images yes i mean this is the 
beauty of poetry. And that's what we mean here by how we choose our words, you know, the choice. We have to be careful what images to use, what um, metaphors and so on. When you look at when you look at it, you know, from the first uh, meaning, maybe you think this is normal when you say frigate, the word frigate is the ship. But when you compare it to a book, you know, here, of course, you start to have, you know, this strange comparison, really. Anyway, the idea, really, I want to uh, say to you, uh, boys and girls today, uh, is that really, in poetry, yes, poetry depends a lot on imagery. It is, it is really uh, that, the, the important point, which is, we always use images, and in, in, in poetry, always, we have to pay attention to understand and to explain these images and to see how these images operate and work and to what effect, um, for example, um, this image uh, has maybe reached and so on. So, yeah, um, the next point here, really, I will leave this for you to read because these are, I put this for you really to, to uh, read them. And I think um, all of them, they are really uh, important in a way of course, I've taken this from so many uh, areas and so many places, and there are books of poetry terms and literary terms. And I've copied this for you, really, as uh, they were, um, of course, and I have summarized briefly uh, a lot of them. And so I really want you, boys and girls, to, um, to um, study these terms because we need them in our uh, course here. Okay, so I will explain a few bits and pieces of it now in this, uh, in this morning's lecture. But um, at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to spend more lectures on this. Uh, next week, I will start with the, with, with the poems, with the studying of poems. But today, I will, I will um, try to uh, highlight some of the stuff for you here. Um, in this uh, introduction. Now, as I said, um, read these. I think they are. I, I think they are very clear, and no need for um, for explanation. Again, you can listen to my previous uh, video on this uh, again, and uh, as much as today's lecture, both really would be nearly the same. Now, the word, uh, I will read, I'll read them quickly with you this morning, today, and I will, as I said, highlight the important stuff. Now, the word ballad, as you can see, it's, it's a song poem, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's any poem, really, uh, but normally, 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 it's written for songs, you know, for, this is traditionally the idea. But today, ballads, you know, ballads can be um, not just that, but they could be anything else, really. But generally, the main traditional meaning of ballad is a song is a song poem which tells a story. It's a narrative poem with simple language that has musical rhythm and can be sung. You know, and again, uh, we always say this. Um, again, as I said to you before last time, you know, the word ballad is used so often by, by poets to mean any poetry. For example, as I told you, um, um, Wordsworth and Coleridge uh, printed their first uh, romantic uh, volume of poetry called Lyrical, they called it Lyrical Ballads. And it was really uh, an amazing book. Uh, of volume of poetry. So, um, yeah, so just uh, I want you to uh, remember this just a little bit of um, the idea. You don't need to memorize 100% these things, no memorization in a real sense, but just to, to, um, to know how things uh, really uh, operate here. So I say it has a simple structure and is usually related to simple four line stanzas rhyming a b um c b you know again this is not always the case often often with a refrain 
which is the repeated words at the end. Um, blank verse uh, is a verse with no rhyme, really. Blank verse is a verse or is a poem with no rhyme. No rhyme. Like what we said, modern poetry. Um, and But it has iambic, it has meter. It does have iambic, iambic pentameter. You know, blank verse, only no rhyme, but there is meter. And I think this is important because later on, uh, maybe later on, those of you who will study, well, I don't know if you will study because you are education people. Um, Shakespeare, most of Shakespeare's plays were written in blank verse. Really, it was all written in blank verse, means no rhyme, but there is meter. Okay. This means it consists of lines of five feet, each foot being iambic, meaning two syllables long, one unstressed followed by a stressed syllable. I'll explain this in a minute because this is to do with the meter. As I told you, we have four meters, and I told you meter in Arabic is al-bahr, bahr al-shar, buhur al-shar, as I mentioned. We have in English, we have four meters, as I, I will show you, iambic, trochaic, anapistic, dactylic. And I will explain this to you in a minute. Now, uh, conceit here is a term used for in poetry, which means a very strange metaphor, very amazing metaphor. You know, wild metaphor, really. Uh, a metaphor describes one thing in terms of another. It is an elaborate and far-fetched metaphor in which a very unlikely connection between two things is established. You know, that's what I mean, elaborate and strange metaphor. It is a metaphor, right? You know, because we say this as um, in, in, in English, we use this uh, all the time, which is, as I say, metaphorical language, which means, you know, very imaginative, you know, um, like when we say, you know, l l no, no frigate like a book. Here, of course, there's the word f uh, as a book. Yeah, maybe you can say, you can say, um, um, uh, maybe this is a simile, not just a metaphor as well, because there is as a book. Anyway, so I'm saying far-fetched, elaborate, very strange metaphor. Uh, I say unlikely connection between two things. Like here, for example, a granite jaw, you know? Granite jaw. Normally, your jaw is not made of granite, you know, which is a very strange metaphor, isn't it? And your jaw, and you know, the granite is, is you know, very solid rock, which is, you know, a massive, amazing stone. So comparing your jaw uh, to a granite rock is a very strange metaphor, isn't it? And that's why I said a granite jaw by, for example, here, done. Dunn's famous description of lovers' souls as being two like, again here, like two legs of a pair of compass and comparing a beautiful woman to an object like a garden or the sun, you know? And I think, you know, um, we have, we shall see so many examples like this, you know, to compare a woman or a, a, a woman's face to a garden, you know, which is really um, a lovely uh, description. In fact, um, but there is, um, uh, there is a poem here. I will show you that here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. This man here. Look at this. This uh, this poet here, page twenty one in my in my booklet that I sent to you. There is notice here. Notice here uh, this poem, really the lovely poet um, Thomas Campion, and the, the 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 poem called the Garden. And I think this is a lovely poem. You know. Notice, there is a garden in her face where roses and white lilies grow. A heavenly paradise is that place wherein all pleasant fruits do flow. These cherries grow which none may buy till cherry ripe themselves do cry. And I'll read this for you later on. But really, this is an amazing, for example, metaphor to compare. You know, he's saying here that, you know, he said, there's a garden in her face, you know, which is an amazing thing and a very strange thing. 
Again, here said they, you, you know, done using the two lovers like a compass. You know compass? This is when you want to draw circles. We use this when we, when in geometry, um, I think we used to use that. So like, like a pin, you pin it like this and a pencil on this side, like two legs here, and you turn it like this to me to draw a, a circle. And Dan said that lovers are like, he said the lover's soul are like, a, like two legs of a compass, which is really amazing description. So they call this conceit, couplet, two lines of poetry, you know, rhyming together. We call this couplet means two, really. Two lines of poetry with the same rhyme and meter, often expressing a, a complete and self-sustained or contained thought. I think that's clear. I'm not going to explain that more. Dramatic monologue, uh, really in poetry we have, we know, you know, in, in drama and in the novel, sometimes we have what we call dialogue. Can you... Um, can you uh, hear me properly and my voice clear? Yes, doctor. Yes, yeah. doctor, all clear. Yes, doctor, we can. Everything fine? Yes, everything doctor. is good. Yes, yes. Everything is fine. Doctor. Yeah? Can I have a question. Basmala, good morning. Good morning, doctor. Yeah. Doctor, okay. the word meter. <laughs> Sorry? Okay, the word meter. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, the yeah, spelling yeah. is M E T E R or M E T R E because I see both of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you see it here today, this morning? No, in the last lecture. I yeah, think well, in the previous see. pages. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really, the American way and the English way, that's it. English way, M, English way, meter, meter. Well, here I kept it as it is. You can see it here. I say meter, M E T R E, the English way, the British way, the British way, M E T R E, the British way, the American way, E R, M E T E R. Here, I kept it for you as it is, really. I did not change it because normally I write in the English way. I don't write in the, in the, Brit, in the American way. Okay? That's the only difference. Okay, I think it's a spelling mistake. No, it's not a spelling mistake. No, no, no. You, you mean the British made a mistake? Uh, um, no, the American. <laughs> okay, okay. No problem. No. Really, I for me because I, because I, I was I, I was educated I I was I was educated in England and I got my PhD from Britain so that's why I use the British way. People who are Americans or who I, I don't mind they, they they do it whatever they like. Yes, somebody wanted to say something. Okay. Good. Uh, doctor. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. What is the meter? <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. I will I will explain it in a minute because I said I will explain this uh, today. Maybe if you wait for ten minutes, you will see it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Now, I say dramatic monologue, here monologue, it's like when we say dialogue, dialogue between two people, monologue when you talk to yourself, really when there are no two people or many people speaking. It's only one, you know, when we say mono, mono or like solo, one really. So when you say monologue means it, to talk to yourself, dialogue within yourself. And in poetry, we have what we call this dramatic monologue, like in a drama, but you speak to yourself, you don't speak to somebody. And that's why it's called dramatic and monologue. We shall have uh, examples. I will show you this 
later on about these examples of monologue. I say, a poem in which an imaginary speaker addresses an audience, or like somebody who's talking to, some, to, to, an, to an audience, right? But in general, in, the, in this case, he will be talking to himself. The poem usually takes place at a critical moment in the speaker's life and offers an indirect revelation of his or her temperament and personality. Monologues are common in plays and long, longer poems. Um, and I will give you an example later on. I will give you an example here by Robert Browning called My Last Duchess. Really, it's an amazing text. I will, I will read, I will explain and study, we will study this later as an example of a dramatic monologue. A, a speaker or the poet speaking to himself and assuming that there is an audience and he's speaking to the audience, but there's nobody. You know, it's the assumption, it's in his mind, okay? Now, dream poetry, it's again, this is one of these uh, phrases we shall see or we know. It's, it's like a poetry which you think it's like in a dream, as if you wrote the poem in a dream. You say, well, oh, oh, oh I, I don't know. I, I wrote this poem while I was asleep, you know. And this is, of course, it's really to run away from responsibility because many people do that just to say, well, I don't know why I said this, but I wrote this when I was dreaming, you know. It's a poem that tells a dream or reflections of relationships between dreams and reality. And, of course, we have in English really many, many dreamers, many poets and people who wrote a lot of stuff. They say, oh, I was, I was in a dream, you know. And I think Shelley, especially the, the um, really the romantic poets, wrote a lot of stuff saying it was all in a vision or like a dream. And I will, we will have this. I will give you examples of that here in this course as we call dream poetry. And here, as known, dream visions or dream allegories, dream poems were a popular, were popular in the Middle Ages. Most of Chaucer's early poems are dream poems, for example. You know, like, as I said, you know, there are many, many examples uh, when poets and, the, and even novelists, you know, even, believe it or not, the first novel in English is written by a, a great man called John Bunyan, and he wrote a book called, the novel called The Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's Progress. And he said, you know, this is about, uh, you know, um, you, the, a character called Christian. And he was going to, to as if to say, in, in a pilgrimage, like going to Mecca, for example. And it's called The Pilgrim's Progress. means the way this pilgrim is going to, you know, this holy place. And um, even in, uh, in uh, I say here, um, Geoffrey Chaucer, his great poem called Canterbury Tales, it's a great narrative poem. And notice here, he called it Tales, and it's really a poem. And why Tales? Because it's narrated by 29 people or 30 people. Each one person will, will narrate his story in poetry. And that's why he called it uh, you know, the Canterbury tales, because these tales were told by these 30 characters when they were going in a pilgrimage to Kent, to Canterbury, where is supposedly to be the sacred place in, in the sacred place in Britain. Anyway, so this is, uh, you know, what we call later on, we shall see again, as uh, I say, a lot of examples of those. Elegy is as I said, is something to do, a poem written uh, to commemorate the death of a person or, you know, people. A lyric poem that laments the death of a person or the eventual death of all people. In a conventional elegy set in classical world, the poet and the subject are spoken as normally of as shepherds. Elegies normally in the traditional sense, in the tra traditional sense, Really, they, they were mostly done, or the characters or the speakers are shepherds. I don't know, maybe to do with rural people, villagers, or countrymen who are really, you know, uh, innocent, lovely, uh, maybe compared, compared to the city. 
In modern criticism, the word elegy is often used to refer to a poem that is mellow, melodramatic maybe, or really melancholic or mournful, you know, a lot means very sad. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Is elegy, is elegy similar to the Ritha in Arabic? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. The... Absolutely. Qasida al Ritha. Very good. Al Ritha. Very good. Yes. Yes. Now, elegy here, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, another, the second one here is called epic. Epic is a term really f means for a very long, 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 long poem. It's like a book, really very long poem. And normally, normally a huge, uh, maybe 200, 300 pages, and it talks really about a great subject, a big subject. And that's why we say um, really uh, epic. In Arabic, we call this al-malhama. Uh, and we know in Arabic, for example, in the classical Arabic, you know, we say al-sha'r al-malhami. Uh, right, and we say Mru'ul Qais and Antara, um, blah, 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 uh, Ibn, Ibn Kulthum, and so on, Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma, etc., etc. These people wrote uh, epics, and these epics normally, normally in those days were written in oral. They were not written, they were recited orally. Now, uh, in English, we have this. Uh, in the same way, uh, but of course, these days maybe um, maybe we don't have we 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 hardly have epics. But there are poets who who did um, write things like this um, in in the Romantic period uh, before that, and 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 so many other people really did this. Now a long, I say, long, most ambitious narrative poem about the adventure of a hero of great historic or legendary importance. The setting is vast and the action, the action is often given cosmic significance through the invention of supernatural forces such as gods, angels, and or demons. You know, here I'm talking about the mythological sense, going back in... Remember, we are talking here not about Arabic literature. We're talking about uh, European, of course, English uh, um, uh, literature. And this is what, you know, what they say, of course, using the classical mythological reference to gods and angels and so on. Epics are typically written in a classical style of grand simplicity with elaborate metaphors and allusions. And here we have examples going back to the Greek I have Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and Virgil, the Aeneid, and John Milton's Paradise Lost. Yes, somebody speaking? I want to say doctor. Something, doctor. Yeah. You can go ahead, Basmala. I can wait. Okay. So, Doctor, is it like what Dante's right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Dante wrote, you know, his huge poem called the Divine Comedy, three volumes. Dante is a crazy man. Three, three big volumes of poetry. One poem called the Divine Comedy. Yeah, absolutely, Abbasmala. Yeah, Very good. Yeah, uh, uh, who was speaking? The young man who? Yeah, yeah, it's me, Ali. Ali. Uh, yes, yeah. I was also going to the Epic of Gilgamesh. I was not sure why it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, but now it makes a little bit more sense. But is it really a poem or it's just a story? Because the Epic of Gilgamesh is more like a, a mythology story, something like that. Yeah, of course. But. Um, um... I mean, I'm not really sure uh, whether it was uh, written in poetry, um, but really it is, as you say, yeah, it's called epic because it's such a long story, such a long narrative poem. I'm not really sure, I must uh, check this, whether it was poetry or, or, or um, uh, it was written in tablets, 
And I think it was uh, in, I'm not sure really, to be honest, I'm not sure whether it was poetry or not, but it was narrating a story of um, uh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh and all this. Yeah, that's why, yeah. Uh, in fact, many, many people and think that it was the first. Well. Yeah, the fir exactly, exactly. The first, the first epic even before the Greek, and believe it or not, Homer and many other people, we think, because Gilgamesh is the Babylonian, old Assyrian, Assyrian, uh, Assyrian, as we say in Arabic, uh, Ashur, um, really yes. uh, is a very old, old Babylonian, Mesopotamian, if you like, uh, um, you know, um, epic. Yeah, of course, because it's mm -hmm. such a long, long, long story talking about this King Gilgamesh and the way the, the terrible thing that he did to his people and so on. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, epigram uh, is something, again, here, I think it's, uh, I, I want uh, to be quicker in this because I don't want to waste uh, more time. I want to move on. Please read these because I think they are easy. Now, I come to the figures of speech because I want to explain to you um, that and the meter and the foot. Now here I come to the meter and the, the uh, question of, um, I was always uh, saying and uh, promising you to explain. Now here, as I said, <clears throat> the word foot, um, which was, uh, as I can say, it's called unit, a small unit of rhythm in a line of poetry. In English poetry, a foot is typically one stressed syllable combined with one or two unstressed syllables. The two standard feet distinguished um, in English are, here when I say feet, really I mean also the meter. Really here the word meter because Later, um, I used the word, you can see it here, meter, and here I wrote it in the British way. You can see here, Basmala. Uh, this is how I think I, I, I paid attention to this, so I wrote it in the British way. So the meter is, as I said uh, in Arabic, al -bahar. The word meter is really, uh, as we say, al -bahar. Why? Why in Arabic they called it al -bahar? <laughs> this is again very funny, funny choice of word. I don't know. But you see, um, in English here we say, notice here I say, the repetition of sound patterns that creates a rhythm in poetry. The same thing as I said above there. The repetition of sound patterns that create a rhythm. That's the idea, how you have this pattern in a, in a, line that's what we say faulun 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 fa'ilatu you know uh, and faulun mustaf'ilun mustaf'ilun fa'ilatu blah 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 you know this is of course you can see we say here the pattern sound pattern and again repetition and because of this repetition and sound patterns here we create rhythm and we say faulun faulun faulu you know, like here we say, dum da, dum da da, dum da da, dum da da, or da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. You know, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. You know, this is of course, you know, the pattern. And here, as I will show you in a minute, as I said, of course, the foot. You know, that's one unit. I say one unit, which contains, you know, two syllables. Notice. Two syllables. Typically, a foot is typically is typically one stressed syllable combined with one or two unstressed syllables. So combination. And here we say the four standard meter or feet are we call it iambic or iamb. The noun is iamb and stressed here. The idea notice here unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable as in the word here we say for example we say here contoured notice we say we say contoured or contoured 
you know, it's 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 really uh, the idea here uh, up to you. But normally we say contort, and that's why he say unstress stress. Notice we say unstress stress. I say da dum da dum. Notice da dum da dum. Notice remind me not remind me not of those beloved those vanished hours when all my soul was given to etc right till time and thou you can see here i was reading remind me not remind me not you following really this is what we say yes, unstress re re unstress mind we say remind i don't say remind okay and we say contort you know stress and taught and this is what we call iambic two syllables unstress stress unstress stress unstress stress like of those beloved we say beloved those because the word vanished originally vanished hours notice va notice um, the, the word here of those beloved, those va nished hours. Notice here, the uh, here sometimes you say, How uh, here we have those stress, whereas here those unstress, isn't it? Here we say, Of those beloved, those va, notice those va, you know, it depends how you how you say it there's no law to say those always unstressed and those always stressed no there's no law to say that but the word here like remind yes there is a law because always ma is this is a stress here remind okay now me not me not you know why not here is stressed Whereas me is unstressed again because of because of the line because of the poetry, not because the word not always is stressed. You understand? Yeah. Again, like when you say here, when all notice when all when all because when I didn't say when all. You see, you say when all my soul was given. Notice given. You see. Given again here, given. I didn't say given as if because the word given two syllables, but the way you pronounce it as in in, in poetry, you say given. You you will not you will not pronounce it as two syllables, one syllable. Again to thee, and so on. Okay, so this is what we call iambic. I will show you in a minute how we do that. Trukayek is the second one, which is the opposite. The opposite. The noun is troki, a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. Exactly the opposite. Here we say as in notice here, torture. Okay, say torture. I didn't say torture. I said torture. That's why you say dumda, 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 dumda. Huh? Whereas Da dum, da dum, da dum. <laughs> Maybe it's funny, but that's life. Notice what he said here. For example, I will read for this to you later on. I will read this poem for you. Once upon, notice, once, a, once, a, once upon, notice, once upon a midnight dreary while I pondered weak and weary. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, when I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. This some visitor I muttered, rapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. This is our great man, Edgar Allan Poe. I'll read this poem for you. This is in Trokai. Stress at the beginning, say, one, sir. Pona, pona, you know, you say ah, of course, here I'm exaggerating to show you, but on ah, once upon ah, 
you know, ah, it's done stress. But I'm I'm just showing you. Notice once a, once a, again. Notice once upon. You say we say upon a, because the word upon you know cut it two syllables. Once upon a midnight. Notice midnight. Stress at the beginning. Midnight. And they say dreary. I didn't say dreary. Dreary. Why lie? Again, why lie? Pondered. Weakened. Weary. You following? This is what we call trochaic. Stress, unstress. Stress, unstress. Opposite of iambic. Now, mostly English poetry is done through this. And I will, I will draw this for you in a minute. Anapistic, the third one. Again, luckily, number three and four, very rarely written in English. Anapistic called, really, the noun is anapist. Two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable. Like here, for example, intercept. Notice, intercept. Intercept. Three. Intercept. Intercept. Da, da, dum. Da, da, dum. Da, da, dum. You see? Intercept. Inter. You see? Three. Unstress. Unstress. Stress. Unstress. Stress. Unstress. <laughs> Sorry. Unstress. Unstress. Stress. As I said, we said intercept. Stress of the last one. As I, you can see. Da, dum. Da, da, dum. Da, da, dum. And dactylic is the opposite. Dactyl, stress syllable followed by two unstressed syllables, like, like for example, here we say suicide. Notice suicide. Stress at the beginning, suicide, isn't it? Suicide. Suicide. Stress first. Okay. Um, notice here natural. P-E-T. Notice natural. P-E-T. Dum da da, dum da da, dum da da. Boys. Yes, doctor. Yes, yes doctor. Uh, yes, yes, doctor. What do you think? Yes, funny, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Just like. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Really, these are. Um, I will draw these for you in a minute. But let me show you here. Continue. You say, uh, how many of these in a line? We call this the meter. So we said, we say monometer or dimeter or trimeter or tetrameter or pentameter and so on. Okay. And again, here, um, I write it in, well, I don't know. Sometimes I, I did not edit this because um, it depends on where I got this online because i copied this from uh, online uh, i found a um, anyway um so monometer means one one foot like, as you can see diameter means two feet trimeter means three feet and tetrameter four feet pentameter five hexa six hepta seven octa eight now in english poetry most poetry is in tetra and penta, four and five, four and five, sometimes trimeter, well, sometimes dimeter, and sometimes monometer, you know? Very rarely you have octameter or heptameter. Maybe here our friend had an octameter. Notice one. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Our crazy man here, the example I gave you is actually octameter. And I will, we will study this poem by Edgar Allan Poe later. It is called here, he wrote it in octameter because he was such an amazing, really, poet, American poet, Edgar Allan Poe. And I think um, those of you who did with me um, last term, yeah, Basmala, you remember anything we did by Edgar Allan Poe, Basmala? Yes. Yeah. What One was it? Stupid. Huh? 
<laughs> I think the hurt heart, something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The hurt heart. Is that... heart. <laughs> the... Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yes. No, no. Yeah. Sorry? Is it I the telltale heart? Uh, yeah, yeah. The telltale heart, heart, not hurt. Heart means your oh. heart. The telltale heart. Anyway, um, I will uh, I will quickly show you um, how we do this one because in the exam, yeah, in the exam, um, yes, yeah, Muhammad, yes, very good heart, yeah. Uh, in the exam, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, how to do this business of um, of uh, to tell me the lie the rhyme. But uh, you're going to ask, uh, how are we going to do it? And I will, I will show you. Um, um, I will show you now um, how you do it. Um, let me see. I will. I want to uh, to show you the whiteboard a little bit. Let me see if I can find from my Google Drive. I think I have something. Doctor? Yeah? So does that mean we violate the rule, stress rules? Where? In the poetry, in the foot, when we divided the the point, the poem. Um, not exactly what we say violate. Um, I will I will show you now I'm trying to uh, to give you to send you um, to share to share with me uh, how we are going to draw this now um, can you uh, please I want you to to share with me the Yeah, now, as I said, yeah, good. I'm saying this is uh, the line, for example, we say unstressed in, in writing. How do we do that? Of course, uh, in writing, we, what's, um, now, in, uh, in, 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 Uh, for example, this is how we do it in, in the line. If you read the line there in front of you, of course, we always say, how do we draw it? In the exam, I want you to just uh, look at the line and you say, for example, unstress like that and stress like this, and then we divide it like this. So we say unstress and stress, and you divide it like that. Okay, we divide it like that all the time, unstress, and then stress and then divide the line you say here for example remind me not remind etc okay so this is how we divide it in can, can you see it no you didn't share the screen mister oh how come i I'm, I'm... Uh, you can just go to the jam board you send the link in the chat yeah I did, but I don't know. How, can you see it? Yeah. 
No, doctor. Uh, it is. No, we can um, still. Yeah, can you see it here? Not yet. Move to the link. Oh, I can see you coming in on the top of my. Hmm? We need uh, to download the application first, I think. Give us let, a few seconds, Doctor. Let me see, let me see. Let me see. I think now you will see it. Yeah? Yes, we can see. see. Do you see anything now? Yes, yes now we see. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Now we can technology, see. technology, technology. Yeah. Okay. You Very see, difficult. so this. Is, yeah, this is what I'm saying here. Unstress, stress, unstress. This is how we do it. For example, in um, in the exam, because you want to say to me, how am I going to tell you this is, and the the divisions here. This is what we call scanning, and we want to scan the line. Unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, etc. And we divide the line. We divide. We divide the the line like this to say how many feet. How many feet do we have? One foot. One foot. One foot. One foot. One. So it means five. One, two, three, four, five. So you say. So you say iambic. Why iambic? Because unstressed stress. And then five say iambic pentameter. Iambic. Pentameter, penta because five, and iambic because unstressed stress. Okay, so if if you want to make it uh, like stress and then unstressed again like that, then stress, uh, unstressed. It depends how you do it. Okay, so this is really the idea. I want you to uh, understand uh, like that. But Mister, how? How how are we gonna know where to stress or where not? Because uh, the poem may have uh, a certain a certain system. Well, uh, you are lucky. You are lucky because ninety five percent of the poems that I will give you, uh, they are iampe. Okay. What because is, really, yeah. There's here. really there's no law. To be honest with you, there is no law unless you have to read the poem and to see what the poet really is saying here. So you will know exactly whether this is um, this is iambic or trochaic. Okay. Um, and normally, normally in the exam, I ask you to divide and to do this when. Uh, you know, we studied the poem, for example. Or I will give you something similar to it, and then you will be able to to know how to do it. But I will I will show you uh, later on in the in the um, in in the course. I will show you that. Okay. Now to go back to um, to where we were. Um, Okay, so this is uh, the idea. I want you really to pay attention to this for the moment about uh, the, the rhyme, uh, sorry, and the division or what we call scan, because later on I say here scansion because the term, as you can see here, uh, um, notice scan, scansion, scansion means the dividing or the division of the line, you know, how to divide the meter and so on. Okay, so really um, the rest of this, um, maybe I still have 20 minutes. Uh, maybe I have time to read some more of this. Now, this again here, I think we know it already, means a verse which is not rhymed uh, at all. And there's no, sometimes there's no meter, no rhyme, no meter, really nothing. So. As the examples I gave you by uh, 
you know, um, William Carlos Williams, if you remember. And here I said, this is a variety of, I, I see a lot of um, examples here, notice. It's unrhymed poetry with lines of rearing lengths and containing no specific metrical pattern, but tries to capture the rhythm of everyday speech. The form allows a poet to exploit a variety of rhythmical effects and so on. You know, really it's, it's, it's strange, but, um, you know, um, there are many people who wrote this. Uh, in real life, um, in, in both, I think, in all languages. Um, the word half rhyme, here notice the word half rhyme, uh, which is not really complete rhyme. Like, for example, here, when consonants replaces rhyme, um, it is called half rhyme. It occurs in poetry with words uh, appearing at the ends of two or more lines which have similar final consonant sounds but have final vowel sounds that differ like when you say escaped and scooped you know like first and fast first and fast and sorry and last really this this is not rhyme but we call this rhyme why because you can see ped and ped but the sound is different really the sound is different that's why we say half rhyme like when you say first and last, you know, ST, ST. This is not complete rhyme, but it's half rhyme. Again, that's not really very important, but sometimes we know it. Heroic couplet means, couplet means two, a pair of two lines, you know, ter, you know two lines, a pair of ten syllable lines. Why ten syllable means iambic, and ten means you know, uh, iambs, iambic pentameters, that rhyme means a line of poetry of iambic pentameter, two lines, two lines of iambic pentameter. A poem, uh, normally, we say, why? Any, any, any two lines can be, can be a heroic couplet. Well, no, in English poetry, that's what they, they said and agreed. And it's used normally by, by English people, English writers, mostly English poets. They use this in, in uh, couplets. And it's done greatly by Alexander Pope and by many other people uh, like him. Here I mention this um, with that. Strongly by Dryden and Alexander Pope. Uh, they wrote all of their poetry in, in, in this called heroic couplet heroic couplet why heroic because it's talking about something really great and grand and important and so on you know poetry written by chaucer spencer shakespeare dunn Byron, and so on and finally i say dryden john dryden and alexander pope um irony i think we know it you know we see this irony of situation and irony of uh, of Dramatic irony, I think uh, you can read that, and I think you know it. Metaphor is clear, I think, as I said, comparison between two things, but you don't mention the word like, for example, a figure of speech wherein a comparison is made between two unlike entities without the use of words like as. Like we say, out of the chimney, out of the chimney of the courthouse, a greyhound of smoke leapt and chased the narrowest wind. Notice, greyhound of smoke leapt and chased. Here, really, this is a very amazing, funny metaphor. Comparing smoke, you know, a greyhound of smoke leapt. You know, this is, of course, a strange metaphor. Um, again, when we say, um, you know, a, uh, all the time, any phrase that you use, um, you know, you say, for example, um, I spoke to a lovely rose uh, today, or I, I was greeted by a lovely, you know, whatever. You know, you compare to any woman or any girl or anybody to anything. You know, but you don't need to say like, you don't see she's like, um, uh, she's like, uh, a, for example, a flower or a rose or a gazelle or whatever. You know, you don't use the word as or like. You say... What a gazelle, 
um, my uh, my whatever. Okay, you know this is the idea. You don't say like or as, whereas simile we say that in simile because the word simile here, uh, where is it? Where is it? Come on, man. Well, I'm not. Um, I have not. I have not included it for you here. I don't know. I thought maybe it's it's easy. Anyway, uh, simile when you say like, you know, when you say as she walks as a cloud, she speaks as a bird. You know, when you say as or like, then this is simile. It's not metaphor. Now we have metaphysical poetry again. Uh, is a term you can use it. Narrative poetry again. We we think we will have a lot of that. A poem that tells a story. And you can see all poems can tell stories, you know, that tell a story, the two basic types of epic and ballad. Poetry as a whole can be split into two broad groups, lyric and narrative. Lyric is immediate and self-revealing response, etc. I think this is clear. We don't need to say that. Octave, which means an octave means a stanza with eight lines. Uh, so notice you can see eight line stanza or an entire poem containing of only eight line stanza, especially by Petrarch. It's called Petrarchan sonnet by later on we shall see maybe by um, the Italian poet uh, Petrarch. <coughs> Petrarch. Oh, again, I think I mentioned this to you before. Elaborate poem. What we said in Shuda again could be seen as in Shuda. You know, a person or something divine or some noble idea. Um, onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia, the use of words that supposedly mimic their meaning in their sound. For example, you say boom, or the word click, or the word drop. You know, the sound is exactly the meaning that we call onomatopoeia, right? You know, like when we say squeak. Or like, uh, you know, as we say here, boom, and the sound and the meaning, the same thing. We call this onomatopoeia. And oxymoron, again here, I, I think this is um, a really uh, uh, figure of speech, which is contradiction. Combination of one syntactical unit of contra contra contradictory terms that seems to be that seems to cancel each other, uh, such as the word in Romeo and Juliet, for example, in Shakespeare's, when he said, when, oh, brawling love, oh, loving hate. You know, loving hate, how? Loving and hate, contradictory. You know, this is what we call oxymoron. In brawling love, you know, in love, you don't brawl. You know, love is opposite of hate. So how we can you say loving hate and brawling love? You know, this is what you call oxymoron, two words contradicting each other, but they are used in combination, uh, which is really very strange. That's why you say combi combination. Um, um, yeah, paradox is the same. You know, here, but paradox, uh, again, we say contradiction, self contradictory statement. You know, like when you say, when you say to someone, oh, I really, oh, I love you, you know, when you really mean I hate you. You know, this is, of course, here we say here, you are paradoxical or you are ironical or you are comic. You know, something appears, it's a statement that appears illogical or contradictory that contradicts itself at first. And again, you can see less is more. Now, how can less be more? You know, at the beginning it's contradictory, but then when you think about it, then you say, oh yeah, less can be more for some people. It depends what less really is for you. So less is more. Maybe at the beginning this is contradictory, but when you think about it, for a poor man, less less money means 100 real, less money. For somebody who is rich, 100 is nothing, so is less. But less 
maybe for me who is Arab man, for example, less here for me is more, is amazing. You know, so this is the idea. John Dunn also was very funny man who did this a lot. Notice, um, paradoxical, he said, is an example of paradox. And in, an, an instance here by John Dunn called death, be not proud. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall not be no more. Death, thou shall die. What? Death, thou shall die? What's this? Here we can't reconcile the idea of death with the idea of death dying in any logical way. This paradox is used because it's the only way in which Dunn can come to terms with the difficult Christian idea of life after death. Paradox gives us a sense of the writer getting on top of complicated ideas. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of things that sometimes you can say this is paradoxical and this is really very contradictory and illogical and crazy sometimes, you know? Now, personification is something against like a figure of speech. When you personify dead things, you give dead things the qualities of persons. A figure of speech that gives human qualities, abstract ideas, animals, or inanimate objects. You give any animal or inanimate object the qualities of a human being, like speaking or feeling or whatever. Like here the in, in the poem uh, by Keats, John Keats, To Autumn, the poem called To Autumn. He's talking to this, you notice here, sitting a careless on a granary floor, and a half pharaoh sound asleep. He is personifying a season here. Personification differ in the degree to which they ask the reader actually to visualize in literal terms in human form. Any inanimate object, any abstract object or inanimate object or dead thing, if you give dead thing human qualities, we call this personification. You personify a stone, you personify a tree. Like Later on, I will show you, later on, maybe, that a lot, when, uh, when, like when you say, this tree is speaking to me, or you look to a rose, and you say, oh, wow, as if this rose is speaking to me. You know, you don't say as if, but uh, this is the idea here. He said, sitting careless on a granary floor. Now, what is sitting? The, the, heart, the, the, um, the, you know, the season here, the season is talking to the season to autumn as if autumn is a man sitting, uh, you know, and, and harvesting his land, sitting, careless. Again, you say, half reaped pharaohs sound asleep. The, the pharaoh or the lines of the earth they look like being sleeping. So the quality of sleep for the human is given to the land, to the earth. And this is the idea. Okay, um, and so on. Really, the rest of this uh, boys and girls, uh, look at that uh, clearly. I think the, you, can, you can find them. Again, we say rhythm. I think I explained that. And scansion, I explained it. Sustet, sus, uh, sorry. Sestet is, as you can see, a six-line, again, six-line stanza. Again, I think um, I explained that maybe before, uh, like um, um, in Petrarchan Italian sonnet. Uh, I mentioned that to you, maybe. Uh, here, again, we use the word soliloquy, and from solo, soliloquy, which is the speech in drama, mainly in drama. It's like when I said monologue, it's, I said solo speech. Solo means one speech to one yourself, you speak to yourself. Notice a solo speech or a monologue, a monologue in a drama used to give the audience information and to develop the speaker's character. 
usually del delivered while the speaker is alone on stage. A soliloquy is intended to present the speaker's innermost thoughts. Soliloquy is when you have a character on stage speaking to us, audience, on his own. Other character ne next to him or near him. You could speak to the ceiling or the wall or to the to sky or whatever. So, or to us, the audience, talking to you like that. You know, like me here today, for example, I am speaking to the screen. You know, I think you are listening there, you are sitting at home, but I'm speaking uh, on my own. I'm speaking to my computer. You understand? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm having some people saying yes to me. That's, uh, that's half, half soliloquy. Okay. A sonnet, uh, the final thing here I said, a sonnet, we have uh, divisions uh, of what we call Petrarchan sonnet and Shakespearean sonnet and Spencerian sonnet. And I think this important thing to know, it's a 14-line poem, always 14-line poem, 14-line poem. Every time we call a sonnet, is a 14-line poem, usually composed in iambic pentameter. Notice, iambic pentameter, five, five feet, and it's iambic, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, remind, 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 employing one of several rhyme schemes. These three types of sonnets upon which all other variations of the form are uh, based, the Petrarchan sonnet, or what's called the Italian sonnet, Spirian sonnet, or the English sonnet, and the Spenserian sonnet, really Spenserian sensor, uh, who is like Shakespeare. It's the same, but it's only the difference in the, the difference in only in rhyme. 14 line and iambic, that's all. But the difference only in, in rhyme. Notice, Petrarchan sonnet consists of an octave rhyming A, B, B, A. Notice. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And a sustet rhyme C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, or C, D, C, or C, D, E, D, C, E. <laughs> Say, oh my God, doctor, are we supposed to, uh, to study this? Yeah, well, no. When you, when you look at this later on, you will see it. I, and I will show you that later on. Don't worry. The Shakespearean sonnet is divided into three quatrains and a couplet, rhymed like A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. And I think this is clear and I want you to memorize this because this is Shakespearean sonnet and all the sonnets we study, they are mostly Shakespearean, okay? And as I said, three means, means three, four, 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 and then two. Four, 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 and then two means you know, uh, 14 lines, 4, 4, 8, 4, 12, and 2, 14. Uh, and as you can see, they are rhymed A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. The, com the couplet provides an epigrammatic comment, and I will show you this later on as examples, okay? The Spencerian is to, to do with Spencer. Really, it's an English one. It's an English one, but uh, with the difference in rhyme. Notice uses three quatrains in a couplet like the Shakespearean, but again, you say, links the three rhyme sequence, like say, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. Spencer wanted to make something funny, unlike Shakespeare, although Spencer was writing maybe a little bit before Shakespeare, because they were contemporaries in some way. Well, that's it, uh, boys and girls. I think the rest here, you can read that on your own. And uh, uh, you can listen to my previous um, previous uh, um, recordings. And uh, you can take notes from wherever, wherever you want. Because as you can see, I'm always uploading this, um, this uh, for you on Moodle. So you can always um, go there and see... Um, for yourself. Um, now I will stop uh, this recording today. If you have any question, you are welcome.